Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here on this rainy day. Um, if you take a seat, I think there's enough seats and the coffee and the food will be available all through the morning. So uh, please enjoy yourself. And uh, uh, let me start off by bringing to the podium a president and dean of the law school, Anthony Crowell. Thanks so much, Ross, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a rainy morning. We guarantee a good breakfast and a nice dry setting to have a great conversation. Um, and we have a very special guest today, uh, Matthew Ketchke, who is the CEO of Con Edison. And we're very excited for uh, his talk. You know, New York Law School uh, has been at the center of civic dialogue for 133 years, and we've always felt a very special responsibility to engage in the key legal and policy matters affecting the city, and certainly um, energy and how we power our city is one of those critical issues. Public service is a hallmark of this institution. One third of our students each year who graduate enter public service and public interest primarily in New York City and state, and so we have an extraordinary bench of leadership throughout, uh, throughout the city and state in a variety of settings. And I will tell you that I'm very happy to say that um, our graduates are key leaders in the energy sector. Um, that includes Justin Driscoll from the class of 81, who currently serves as the president of the New York Power Authority, uh, a key member of our board of trustees, John McMahon, who's from the class of 1976. He was the former CEO of LIPA, CEO of Orange and Rockland Utilities, and he started his career at and rose to executive vice president and general counsel of Con Ed. And then there's Jim Dixon, who is now the uh, senior vice president and chief legal officer of RWE Clean Energy, and who similarly, like John McMahon, held SVP and chief legal officer of Con Ed and was in the energy business. So there's such a rich history of our uh, graduates going into leadership positions in this space. Um, so we're particularly appreciative of, of uh, Mr. Ketchke's joining us this morning. And I'll just say that the Center for New York City Law continues to grow in its reach each and every day. As you know, we recently expanded our staff and we're expanding our offerings. And all that is due to the wonderful work for 30 years of our center director and founder, Professor Ross Sandler. And I want to just give a special shout out to Alice Sandler, his spouse, who has been a co-host of these breakfasts for all these 30 years. And they consider this their jubilee year here, for, you know, just a, a point of humor. But in any event, I just want to give a quick shout out to our terrific staff at the Center for New York City Law, our program director and executive editor, Ben Max, distinguished fellow and counsel, Stephen Lewis, senior fellow and director of the Census and Redistricting Institute, Jeff Weiss, city, law, city land editor, Veronica Rose, and city law administrative coordinator, Rose White. Uh, it's a terrific team, and today we're going to have a terrific presentation. With that, I'll bring Ross back up for a more formal introduction. Uh, come on up, Ross. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Well, thank you all. Um, uh, first, uh, let me just um, thank uh, our uh, founding sponsors, Con Edison, who's been with us for 30 years, Verizon, and the law firm of Greenberg Traurig. And I also want to thank all of you for being here and for those of you who have the gold star on your name tag for making a contribution, I really appreciate that. And that, that's what makes, allows us to do this and keep these breakfasts going. I should say before I do the introduction that we've had mayors, chair of the city planning commission, uh, head of the council, chief justice, judges, and they never had as many people come up with private problems as it just came up. The Matt Chatchke. I have never seen so many. Uh, and uh, I don't know it's whether it's because Con Ed is so important and wonderful or uh, because there are other issues out there. But I want to thank you, Matt. You did, help, you did everything with great uh, diplomacy and cordiality. Uh, Matt was raised in the Boston area. Uh, he attended local public schools. He played baseball, captain of his college baseball team. He earned a bachelor's and master's degree from the Stevens Institute of Technology and in, uh, in Mechanical Engineering and a master's degree from Columbia. Uh, it, uh, Stevens has um, a co-op program, and Matt was part of that co-op program. And 
The area he liked the best was utilities, so when he graduated in 1995, he came to Con Ed, it was his first job, uh, and uh, he came in as a management trainee. And in those days, uh, Con Ed uh, started its management trainees in the field. So they sent uh, Matt to uh, school at uh, the Learning Center in Long Island City to learn to be a splicer. Uh, he, that's difficult work, and it can be very dangerous if not done correctly, work that's done mostly underground. After completing his training, he became a, a supervisor in, here in Manhattan, in Manhattan Electric, uh, and in the underground. Now, in Con Edison, the underground is really underground. It's manholes, it's vaults, uh, it's basements, all under the sidewalks and streets of New York. And Matt told me, uh, he said that he thought he'd been in every basement of a large building in lower Manhattan and his duties as supervisor and cable splicer. Con Edison is a wonderful company for those who work there because it has a strong tradition of growing its own executives. And Matt was, Matt was early recognized uh, as a person with uh, leadership ability and uh, was recognized by the officers of the company. And he advanced through the management ranks of Con Edison, uh, mostly in the electric uh, uh, area, but also as head of the Learning Center, which is this extraordinary facility in Long Island City. It looks like a university where Con Edison routinely trains thousands of new employees to become skilled workers in the electric, gas, and steam business. Uh, Superstorm Sandy in 2012 altered uh, much in New York at Con Edison as well, but also uh, Matt Ketchke's career. Uh, in the aftermath of the storm, uh, Con Edison moved Matt Ketchke uh, away from operations and assigned him to most of the areas of planning for the future. What, what, what kind of problems uh, and things that Con Ed have to do to meet the future demands, regulatory demands, climate demands, resilience demands? And Con Edison's future is full of challenges. For electric, protecting the electric transformers and other equipment from uh, rising oceans, heavier rain, heavy, uh, heavier rains, increased heat. For steam, generating steam without fossil fuel. For gas, dealing with the potential phase out of the entire gas business. For demand, meeting the demand of electric vehicles. For its electronic systems, protecting those systems from hackers and faults. The experience that Matt had after Superstorm Sandy and doing the planning and working in those future areas uh, made him uh, one of the obvious candidates to take the position of president of Con Edison. And in 2020, the Con Edison's board appointed Matt Ketchke as president. New York Law School is pleased to welcome you, Matt Ketchke, to the podium here at New York Law School. Wow. So thank you, Ross. Um, one, I've just learned that I'm going to have Ross write my resume for me because he sounds, <laughs> makes me sound much, much more interesting than I think I really am. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to come here today and address this group. Um, so Con Ed and New York Law have a couple things in common. I think one of the biggest ones is that we are really part of the long-term fabric of New York City. Um, Con Ed has a long relationship with New York Law. We have a number of alumni who have both worked for the company and continue to work for the company. Um, and it, it's a big part of kind of being a New Yorker. These are foundational New York institutions. So um, being that you're all New Yorkers and going to be active audience, I'm sure I got a question for you. How many people this morning started today with maybe a warm shower, hands, a cup of coffee, uh, took a subway ride, sat at a traffic light? So whether you know it or not, um, the 10 million people who live and work in New York City use energy every single day. It is foundational to how we live a life in a vertical city like New York. Um, the people of Con Ed essentially power New York City, and most people don't know that we do it every single day. And actually, we kind of like it that way. If the lights stay on, if your apartment stays warm, if the subways keep running, that means we're all doing our jobs very well. Um, but Con Ed is a centralist city. We are about 13,000 people who pretty much all live and work in New York City, um, make up Con Edison. Um, we're a growing company. 
Last year, we hired 1,700 new people. To address all the challenges that Ross laid out, we had 1,700 new employees, and they were from New York. Over half of them were from disadvantaged communities around the New York City area. Over 70% of them were people of color. We are New Yorkers. We live and work here every day, and we represent the city that we serve. Um, we are a pretty big company. Con Ed is one of the larger investor-owned utilities in the United States. Um, we serve New York City and Westchester County with electric, gas, and steam service. Um, we are actually the last investor-owned utility that's headquartered, electric utility headquartered in New York. So Con Ed, thank you. Um, all of the other investor-owned utilities in New York State are actually owned by foreign entities. Um, Con Ed, we, we are part of this city. We are here and we have been here for a long time. Con Ed's history is pretty long. We have been around for over 200 years, 201 years. Um, we are the oldest continuously traded stock on the New York Stock Exchange. One of the things about Con Ed and serving a city like this is we're, we're in this for the long haul, the long duration. Sometimes people ask me, they look and go like, I kind of know my history, and how could you have been around for 201 years if Edison invented the light bulb in 1876? That doesn't make sense. Um, Con Ed actually started as a natural, as a manufactured gas company, a gas lighting company. One of the first gas lighting companies um, in the United States. We were incorporated 201 years ago, um, and our first product was lighting gas, manufactured gas, actually made from whale oil. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about sustainability today. You want to talk about non-sustainable fuel. Think about using whale oil to make gas to light your home. That's, that's really a non-sustainable fuel. We've a lot, uh, evolved a lot since that time. Um, the company that I work for today serves over 10 million people. Um, we provide electric service to 3.3 million customers, over 10 million people. It's all of New York City, with the exception of a little tiny part of the Far Rockaways um, and Westchester County. We provide gas service in Manhattan, the Bronx, and Westchester County. And we provide steam service in Manhattan, south of 96th Street. We have what is the largest district heating steam in the United district heating system in the United States. If you ever see a movie, a New York City shot movie, you'll see that kind of iconic picture of a New York City taxi cab driving and a steam. That's iconically New York. That's our steam system at work. Um, and that serves 1,500 of the most iconic buildings in New York City, places like Grand Central Station, um, Empire State Building, Chrysler Building. So as Ross said, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been working for Con Ed for 28 years. I've done a number of different jobs. It's a fantastic place to work. Um, but a lot is changing in the energy industry. So we've been around for 200 years. I dare say that more is changing in the energy industry today at least any time in my tenure and likely any time in our recent or even longer term history. So what is driving that change in the energy industry? This product that every single one of us use every day that most people don't think about, what's changing that and what's making it change quickly? And it's really a couple of things. I'd say one is climate change. Um, climate change is real, it's here today, and the need to think about climate change and the impacts both of climate on us today and as we go forward. The second thing is driving climate change is increased levels of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. How do we think about greenhouse gas emissions? The reality is that energy, how we use energy, how we produce energy every single day is one of the significant contributors to greenhouse gas emissions across the world. And it's no different for us here in New York City. So greenhouse gas emissions. And then changes in technology. Technology has advanced rapidly, how we make energy, how we move energy, how we store energy, and how we use energy is changing rapidly with change in technology. So climate change, public policy, and change in technology are the things that are really, really driving rapid change in the industry they work in. One of the analogies I use is our business is essential to life every day. We want people to not even think about it, turn the lights on, the lights come on, but we're gonna have to evolve the systems that power New York City and Westchester County and do it on the fly. It's kind of like changing a jet engine on a plane in flight. How do you think about evolving these systems as you continue to maintain everyday reliability, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year? So as we think about public policy, what is the public policy that's driving some of this change? What is the government doing that's saying, how do we change this? And it's really a couple big things. In this, at the state level, it's the CLCPA, or Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. That was really you know, nation-leading legislation that was passed in New York a couple of years ago to think about 
climate change and how it's impacting our state and essentially codify in state law a requirement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions statewide for the entire state economy down to net zero by 2050. That's a huge change in how energy is going to be used, how transportation is going to work, how agriculture is going to work, how industry is going to work, completely remaking our economy to make it essentially net carbon neutral by 2050. That's a huge challenge. At the more local level, probably one of the biggest drawings is Local Law 97, which really looks at our buildings and how do we think about our stock of buildings and decarbonizing buildings. Across the United States, CO2 emissions come from probably three biggest categories. Production of electricity and use of electricity is one of the biggest ones across the country. It's actually a little bit lower in New York. New York already starts out as being a pretty low emissions location. How we heat our buildings is one of the second ones. So heating of buildings, that's actually the largest CO2 emissions category in New York City. So our building stock and thinking about the venerable building stock, these historic buildings we have, how we make them less impactful on the environment. And the third area is transportation. So for a lot of the country, transportation is one of the largest sources of CO2 emissions. But if I asked who actually drove here by private car today and parked in a big parking lot, as New Yorkers, we don't. We use a lot of public transportation. We're pretty efficient as it goes to transportation. So transportation is a little bit lower for New York City and Westchester County as compared to the rest of the country. But thinking about the impacts of climate change is going to be how do we decarbonize the production of electricity? How do we reduce the amount of fossil fuels that go into heating our buildings? And how do we electrify transportation and decarbonize all three of those to get down to kind of net zero CO2 emissions for the entire state? There are some other big drivers in the state that don't affect us so much here in New York City. Heavy industry is one. We don't have so much heavy industry, so it's less of an issue for us here in New York City. And then agriculture. There's not that much agriculture in New York City either. So those are two of the other big drivers around. But transportation, building stock, and electricity are really the keys to how we think about decarbonization to address climate change. So what is climate change? You know, it, it's not an abstract concept for us. Climate change is here and it's here today. Ross talked about kind of the arc of my career and one of the big things that happened in my career was Hurricane Sandy. And how many of you were here in New York for Sandy? It was a monumentally impactful event for New York City. Something odd happened with Hurricane Sandy that hurricanes aren't supposed to do. Turned left. Hurricane came up the East Coast and turned left and slammed in New York. That, that's not supposed to happen. That's just indicative of what we are increasingly seeing, which is climate events which are outside of the range of what we've historically seen. Historically high rainfall events, historically hot spells, and historically cold spells, kind of more volatility in our overall climate. As a company that operates energy infrastructure, it's absolutely critical. How do we think about dealing with climate change? It's really in three parts, because the reality is the climate change is here today. We are seeing increasingly volatile weather events and we have to deal with them. And the three ways we think about doing that is first by applying science. You know, what does the climate say? And, and this is a place that we get help. We did an industry leading study with Columbia University looking at climate impact and the vulnerability of our system's climate impact, not only today, but the climate we expect to see over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, as, as you walk out, you're going to see there's actually a substation right across the street from here. This is a Leonard Street substation that supplies this area. That substation went that service about 80 years ago at that location. We continue to upgrade, enhance, and, and reinvest in it. But assets that serve energy need, they're long-term assets. We build them for the long term. These are not things that are throwaway. They typically will serve 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. So as we think about building our systems, we have to build them both for the climate of today and the climate of tomorrow because they are long lived assets. So looking at climate science to say, what is the climate today and what's it gonna be? And then how do we build our system? We think about hard, doing three things. The first is to harden our systems. How do we make them harder and harden them against the impact of storms? One of the things we saw during Hurricane Sandy was an incredible storm surge that rolled into lower Manhattan. Um, and overtopped a number of facilities and flooded out a number of facilities. Hardening basically is how do we enhance our survivability to increasingly volatile storm events, whether that's flooding, winds. We expect probably in the next 20 years, the climate of New York in the summertime is going to feel more like the climate of Huntsville, Alabama. We're going to see more hot, humid days. So how do you harden our systems? 
That's investing in things that can withstand greater temperature variations, stronger winds. But the reality is you can't harden everything. You cannot make everything bulletproof. So the next piece is mitigation. How do we think about minimizing the impact when those events really come so it affects the fewest number of people possible? Ways we're doing this by segmenting parts of our system. How do you cut off the parts that are, example, in a flood prone area where if it's going to flood and you can't keep the all of the ocean at bay, you can segment that portion off so it doesn't impact the larger parts of the system. We've been pretty successful in doing that. During Sandy, we saw most of Midtown Manhattan South was out of power for several days because of the impact beyond just the immediately flooded area. So segmenting our system. So hardening, mitigating by segmentation, and then responding. How do we make sure that we have enough resources on the ground so that we can respond when a storm happens? Um, we built a storm center up in, in um, Rockland County that we can fly in up to 400 linemen, staff 200 bucket trucks that are on standby, fly them in from any place in the country to be able to respond once you've had a storm event. So as we think of climate change and, and for the Con Ed system of energy delivery, it's really how do we harden it? How do we mitigate the events when they happen, realizing we can't protect anything? And then how do you make sure they have the right resources to respond? But climate change, it's gonna go beyond just the impacts. It's how do we mitigate the impact that we're having now? And that's how do we think about reducing overall carbon dioxide emissions from energy? Um, one of the ways to do that is we think about beginning to use more and more renewable energy. In New York, we already have a lot of renewable energy and non-carbon dioxide emitting energy. We have some of the biggest hydro facilities in the world that are up along um, in, in northern New York State, along the St. Lawrence River, uh, Niagara Falls. A lot of that flows down to the New York City area by transmission lines. But today, a lot of the power generated in New York City is still from fossil fuel, predominantly natural gas. One of the ways that we are working to address that and working with the state is by trying to build out more and more renewable generation. The best resource that we have downstate is actually out in the Atlantic Ocean, offshore wind. The ability to build offshore wind farms that then come into New York City um, to bring those in. So one of the uh, investments that we're making is in a substation in, in the Brooklyn area. It's actually on the site of a former fossil fuel power plant where we'll be able to integrate over 6,000 megawatts of offshore wind brought in from the Atlantic Ocean and then moved out to growing areas in Brooklyn and Queens where we see low growing today. So talking about climate change and what com the company's doing, there's, we, we operate three different businesses. So we are a steam system, a gas system, an electric system, really kind of a portfolio of energy solutions that help serve our customers. And I want to talk a little bit about the future of each of those systems and how it's going to change. So we'll start with the smallest, our steam system. And most people don't even know that we have a steam system, but it does serve 1,500 customers. 1,500 sounds small, except it's all of these really big buildings, Grand Central Station, Rockefeller Center, these huge iconic buildings in New York City. Um, our steam system is actually extremely efficient today. We use predominantly natural gas to make steam that heats buildings, and as a byproduct, we make electricity. It's actually one of the most efficient ways to both heat buildings and make electricity that we have today. Um, as we think about decarbonizing the city and think about changing, one of the things is, can we make all these buildings all electric? it's gonna be really hard to electrify some of these legacy buildings. So the 1,500 or so customers that we serve with our steam system, we think it's actually going to be much easier to decarbonize all the way back at the power plant level, to be able to change how we make steam without using fossil fuels or CO2 emissions to essentially lower overall carbon dioxide emissions and not have to have an iconic building like Grand Central Station tear out all of their existing heating equipment. Um, there's some new technology that we're deploying to try to make that happen. High efficiency heat pumps to the plant, using carbon capture at the power plant level, potentially burning hydrogen made from renewable energy at the power plant level, and renewable natural gas that's made from bio waste. So all of those options are ways that we think we can decarbonize steam production and make it much easier for these iconic buildings in New York City to lower their overall carbon footprint at the power plant and steam plant level as opposed to trying to do it at the building. The second system that we operate is a natural gas system. Our natural gas system is a big system. It serves over 1.1 million customers today. There's been a lot of talk, particularly in New York, about how we need to move off of fossil fuel. And as an energy executive, kind of executive, I agree. 
to move and, and decrease our overall impact on CO2 emissions and climate change, we're going to need to burn less and less fossil fuels, including natural gas over time. So this is a little unusual for an executive, a company that runs a gas company, but I think we're going to sell less, less gas and we're going to continue to sell less gas over time. We think our natural gas system will shrink and serve fewer customers with less overall gas throughput over time. Um, that has We haven't quite hit that tipping point yet, though. So just this winter in January, you might remember kind of third week in January or so, we had a real cold snap in New York. Overnight temperatures got down around 15 degrees. On that night, we moved more gas to our natural gas system than any day in our history. So while we may talk about that the energy change is coming and the move off fossil fuels here, and as, as an energy executive, I'm working to make those things happen. One of the things we have to focus on with our natural gas system is maintaining the safety and reliability of that system as we go through this transition. The natural gas system is absolutely critical to life here in New York State today. And we think it's going to evolve and change. And I think there are probably two different pathways, and it's not clear to me yet which pathway will be on with natural gas. Both of them involve less and less carbon dioxide emissions from natural gas and selling less gas and less utilization of the gas system. The divergence really is, do we electrify everything? Do we move everything to electricity and move completely away from natural gas and other fossil fuels? That's kind of the electric, the full electrification scenario. The second scenario is, do we look at a hybrid solution where you use the natural gas infrastructure to flow a non-CO2 emitting gas? So biogas, this is gas that's made from things like bio waste or uh, sewage plant sludge. So biogas or synthetic methane made from renewables. What you have to believe in that scenario is that the technology to develop those at scale really works. But the benefit of the hybrid solution in selling less gas, but still using your natural gas infrastructure, is that you can minimize how much electric infrastructure you need to build to meet the peak demand. So one scenario we think is a hybrid solution, kind of saving the gas system, but shrinking it way down, delivering less fuel through it, but having that be a non-CO2 emitting fuel. Um, the second scenario is we electrify everything and fully wind that system down, except for a few customers like hospitals and other things that really need some kind of fuel to burn. Um, it's not completely clear yet that the technology is going to be there to make a non-CO2 emitting fuel at cost, but places like the Department of Energy and others are kind of working on that. The third commodity we have is electric. And what most people think of Con Ed as electric, and that's kind of our biggest commodity. We serve 3.3 million customers with our electric system. Um, it is the most reliable electric system in the United States. Um, it is an incredibly complicated system. Um, we serve our customers about 10 times the reliability of the US average. Um, if you live in New York City, you likely will see an outage like about once every 20 years. If you live in a lot of the rest of the country, you would see one about once every year. Um, so we have an extremely reliable system. It's also an extremely energy dense system. There are parts of midtown Manhattan around the Rock Center area where the load density is 1000 megawatts a square mile. Just for reference, the entire combined state of New Hampshire and Vermont, that's about what the load is of the entirety of those two states combined. So in one square mile, you have what two states worth of people use. So it's an incredibly dense urban infrastructure that we serve. That system works incredibly well, but we're gonna to need to think about evolving that system as we transition. One way is this integration of more renewables that I talked about. How are you bring more renewable energy in? And then how do we serve more and more end use energy needs with electricity? So today, our Con Ed electric system, it hits its peak, its maximum utilization in the summertime, because what drives our, our system capacity, what drives how big our system needs to be, our maximum utilization is essentially on the hottest, muggiest, stickiest, nastiest New York City summer day, air conditioning load. As we think about moving forward in time, that's going to change, because as more and more buildings heat with electricity, we're going to shift back to being a winter peaking utility. 
So in the 1950s, Con Ed was a winter peaking utility. We think sometime in the next decade, Con Ed will shift back to being a winter peaking utility as we move more and more heating of our buildings, which I said is the biggest driver of CO2 emissions in New York City, off of fossil fuel, off of gas, off of oil, and move that onto electricity. Our systems will shift from a summertime peaking to a wintertime peaking. As it moves through that, then we're going to see significant increases in demand. So as I mentioned, if we, if we move all of the fossil fuel off of how people heat their buildings, if we eliminate all oil and gas from heating, our electric systems probably need to double in their overall size and delivery capacity. That means twice as many substations, twice as many cables in the street, twice as many generating sources to be able to provide that energy. Um, what you need to believe in that scenario is that we figure out ways to store electricity for the long term. That's not easy to do. Electricity is a weird commodity. Electricity production and consumption basically have to match at the speed of light. There's not really good ways to store electricity. Every one of us now, it walked in here, probably has a cell phone that has a lithium ion battery and the battery technology has really advanced in the last bunch of years. And there's a lot of talk about battery packs Tesla batteries that utilities are deploying to be able to store energy. And those are really good, but they're really good at storing energy in a day and dispatching it later in the day or in the morning or in the middle of the day when the sun is shining and dispatching it at night when the sun doesn't shine. The biggest challenge to the all electrification scenario is that we will produce lots and lots and lots of renewable energy in the springtime and the fall when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining but it's not really hot or really cold in our buildings. So you have this overproduction supply in the spring and fall, and you'll have a shortage of capacity in the winter and summer when people are trying to cool their homes or heat their homes. So that is the biggest challenge, long-term energy storage. That's a technology that has not been solved for and the technology we have to solve for. So as I sit here today looking for an energy future, I think we're really dependent on two big pieces of technology that will support public policy. Can we figure out how to make low carbon fuels that we can flow through the existing gas system? Or can we figure out how to make long duration energy storage that can backstop the electric system? And that's essentially the divergence that we stand at today. When some other people will tell you and advocate for that we have all the technology today to fully decarbonize the energy ecosystem, they, we don't. The reality is we do not those technical challenges are real and ones that we're going to have to solve in the next decade or so to be able to keep our energy systems reliable. Um, I'm really confident we'll be able to solve it. There are a lot of people working really hard at that, both Con Ed and across the entire United States. In the near term, how we solve this is essentially the same path. So we have a full electrification pathway and a hybrid pathway. The near term is the same. We need to build out the energy, the electric delivery infrastructure today to be ready for the challenge of tomorrow, because under all of these scenarios, we still will use more and more electricity. For Con Ed, that means we're building new substations and new circuits. We hadn't built a new substation for about 10 years. Right now, we have four new substations in development that will go in service in the next five years. One in downtown Brooklyn um, to in help integrate offshore wind and move renewable energy. Another one, the Canarsie section of Brooklyn, to meet growing demand in that area. And then two out in eastern Queens to supply increasing demand around Kennedy Airport and the, uh, the fleets of vehicles that are housed around the Kennedy Airport area, both for MTA buses and delivery fleets that will electrify. So building out electric delivery infrastructure is one of the key elements in the next couple of years that we're going to have to do. The second is maintaining our gas reliability while we continue to think about moving customers off. So making sure that we have the safety and reliability of that gas system that's critical as we think about winding it down. And the third is going to be for our steam system, looking at how we continue to decarbonize the production of steam that's essential and critical to some of the iconic buildings here around New York City. So as I said in the beginning, those challenges, they sound an awful lot like how do we change the jet engines on airplane while we're in flight. I have a lot of confidence in our ability to do it uh, in large measure because of the people I work with at Con Ed. Again, 13,000 of the most incredible professional people who power this city every single day. We have an incredible team with diverse talent, skills, and ability, some of them being graduates of this institution who help navigate through this increasingly complicated sets of problems that we're going to have to solve. 
and that we really need to solve in a way that most New York City residents never know it was an issue because, you know, energy, again, is an interesting commodity. It's essential to life. And a really good day for me as an energy executive is when nobody thinks about us. So Ross had warned me that this group often has lots and lots of really good questions. So I would really love to open up to questions from the audience. Well, that, that was terrific. Now, uh, the microphone, come to the microphone and so everybody can hear. We're recording this and it's also videoed. Uh, and so let's have uh, questions. I know many of you do have questions, hopefully not about your personal bill. But other than that, uh, and I also, I want to welcome a lot of people from Con Ed who are here. And I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, very loyal and very helpful. And we're very happy that you're here. So go ahead, Michael. Yes, I'm Michael Myers. I'm the president of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. Michael, Michael we couldn't tell us who you're from again. We missed it. Michael Myers, president of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. My question relates to blackouts. I'm a young, relatively young man. We've had two blackouts in New York City in my re in memory. So I moved to a co-op that I thought would be independent, have their own power system mm -hmm. to protect us from. Then when I found out recently, our, our co-op relies on Con Edison. <laughs> but nevertheless, because they, they do have their own independent power source, they were kept in the light. My question to you is, how do, now that we have out of the blackout period, we still get brownouts. Every summer, I read something or a notice saying, you've got to reduce power, you've got to reduce power, cut off your, your, electric, your, your air conditioning, everything. How do we get out of the situation of brownouts? Brown mm -hmm. What is Con Edison doing to keep us in the light? Okay. So, uh, and you live in a co-op that has what sounds like co-generation where you have on-site in power production for the facility. Co-op City is a pretty good example of that. There are several around the city that have their own power generation and that are interconnected to Con Ed. Um, so I, it sounds like your question is less about the specifics of your facility because they are, they generate there, but that as we go through summertime periods, you often hear Con Ed in the news um, talking about energy usage in the summertime. So... One, Con Ed does have kind of statistically, and we've been awarded multiple years running for pretty much the last decade every year, the most reliable energy delivery systems for electric of any place in the country. So we do operate a very, very complicated system, but the overall reliability of that system is higher than just about any place else you could go in the world. We serve New York City. So one of the things, and when we get to the summertime, and summertime today is when we see our peak energy usage. So when it's really hot out, air conditioners crank up, and that's kind of our peak utilization. Because we want people to conserve energy, that's also when energy is most expensive and the highest demands. Is we will proactively go out and, and tell people, this is a good day, it's a, a peak day, good day to conserve. If you can modify your energy usage on the hottest summer day and shift non-essential energy usage to a later period of time, it lowers overall costs to all customers that they pay in the system. It makes the system a little bit more reliable, has some additional benefit to um, improving air quality because the, the last peak or fossil fired plant doesn't have to run. So there's a lot of reasons that we make announcements on those hottest summer days for conservation. Most of them have nothing to do with that we have a brownout or brownout issue or, or a lack of capacity. The vast majority of the time we have plenty of capacity. Occasionally we do have a failure. Um, and that's what you know the employees will go out and get that fixed as quickly as we can. Ross mentioned a lot of what we how we serve New York City is underground. That makes us much more reliable because the wind won't blow the power line down, but it also makes it much harder to find a problem and fix it. When you have an overhead wire, an overhead wire comes down, it becomes very obvious where that problem is. If you have an underground system, when a failure occurs, the troubleshooting in doing that, and it's actually what I did at the very beginning of my career, is a little bit more complicated. Um, and we we'll often make local appeals to say, hey, you know, we have a little bit of a problem in the neighborhood. We're working on it. Please conserve power to the degree you can. Thanks. My name is uh, Peter Cohen. I'm with the Transportation Research Forum. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, right now, the city is Newtown Creek facility in Brooklyn to National Grid. They are currently constructing uh, very large quantities of um, digestion capacity in Hunts Point. 
And that's going to handle not only wastewater, but a lot of organic waste, food. Are you looking at perhaps buying some of that gas? Yes. So we've been in conversations with um, the DEP about how what their, what their plans are, the potential use for that, the ability to use that biogas either to blend into our existing natural gas system for natural gas customers or potentially in our steam um, generating facilities to lower the overall CO2 emissions from steam plants. So those are very large facilities relative to what's existed prior. They're an incremental first step in the production of biogas um, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. I had to sit oh, down. Uh, uh, I want to apologize to everybody, okay? Uh, I uh, had panic attacks. So I apologize if I seem a little whack out, but uh, I'm a little stressed. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today. I'm a fan of electricity from Ben Franklin fly, fly, flying his kite to Dunderstruck by ACDC, okay? But between Thomas Edison, Tesla is my boy, all right? He's at a Paisan. I hear somebody talking to me. Let me, let me just ask you the, the question to is, or comment and then the, yeah, please, thank you. I'm a private homeowner up in the Bronx, and you, you, most of the people here probably are from Manhattan or organizations, but I'm the private owner, and I get the letters in the mail about changing over and, uh, you know, $28,000, and the personnel in the Bronx that come knocking on my door or who I talk to on the phone are not like talking to the president of Con Ed, and not very well train. My question is, uh, is well, a comment and question is, is that electric heating is not as efficient as the steam. And when furnaces were built, they could melt iron, but they have a furnace in your house. And the thing is, and this guy is really wants me to have an ADA attack here. No, we would okay. like to. My just, question is: There are other people. Who are is there any to way get... you can pick up the whole tab to do this? Because this is to save the environment, and I can't afford to do it. And the other thing is that the developers are taking over all the private houses in the Bronx, so it doesn't pay for us to even think about it, because that's what's happening. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You want to comment? Thank you. First, thank you for that. It was unbelievably fascinating and yeah. very clear. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't use one word in your presentation that I was hoping you'd use, nuclear. As a former Navy guy, we used to think that was the best and the brightest in the future. Is it the economics or the politics or something else that it's not part, or we didn't hear it as part of the solution? Okay. So thanks for the question. So anybody who is ex-Navy nuclear has a great deal of pride in that program and feels strongly about nuclear. Um, I did not mention nuclear in this. I have a, kind of other versions of this conversation I have where we do talk a little bit more about nuclear. Um, the practical reality of the part of the world that we serve is a very dense urban infrastructure where Con Ed owned nuclear is probably not gonna be part of the near term solution. Um, I do think as an engineer, that nuclear, particularly some of the advanced nuclear that's being developed, is going to be part of the solution, both internationally and across the United States. I think it's less likely to show up here in the near term, given some of the demands and needs. That said, there are four big nuclear power plants that operate in New York State. Um, the position we've advocated for is that those need to continue to operate in the near term because they provide a lot of clean energy. Um, and that continued development of advanced nuclear reactors and what's called small modular nuclear reactors, which are a lot like the reactors that are on Navy ships, may be part of the solution. It's just probably not the solution that we will easily deploy in kind of the New York City area in the near term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kachke. Uh, I'm Emily Miller. I'm sorry, I apologize. The transportation has stopped me from arriving here on time. But I think the part that I heard is just totally fascinating. And thank you very much for the comprehensiveness of use of electricity. But I think for a cleaner environment, we are very much interested in how solar energy would be continually inject into our civilians' life at the same time as a good op uh, alternative to electricity. And 
post seems to have a good, seems to need a good storage solution. And uh, how are we going to work on this hand in hand for to improve the life of our New York City citizens yeah. uh, and the citizens? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. I kind of generically lump together renewable generation into one category, but renewables for the near term for New York City really means wind and probably the best source of wind for New York City is going to be offshore wind off of kind of the, the South Shore of Long Island. So that's probably the best resource available because the wind blows pretty consistently offshore um, and allows us to get large volumes of electricity. Solar is absolutely a part of the overall solution, both distributed rooftop solar that's integrated at a distribution level and then large scale solar facilities. One of the constraining factors for New York, and this was kind of an energy talk that was very focused on New York City, is our rooftops are often a lot smaller compared to the utilization. So if you think about how much energy this building uses and then how much space there is in the roof, it's, it's not particularly big. And then open space, land use. Land is very expensive and valuable in New York City, so we're unlikely to have a solar facility um, in New York City that's of the kind of scale and scope. If you, if just for scale purposes, a large scale solar facility that might make a couple hundred megawatts of solar when the sun's shining is probably, you know, six or seven miles long and two miles wide. So that's like cover all of Central Park with solar panels and you'll get a little tiny piece of what the demands are for a place like New York City. So it, it's part of the solution. I think more large scale solar will be built in the Southwestern United States, more onshore wind will be built in places like Texas and Oklahoma, and more offshore wind will be built in places like the Eastern United States. And it's really tapping into those natural resources in ways that make sense as they vary across the country. Thank you. Hi, Rebecca Kraft, Kavala, uh, formerly Con Ed, I guess just, I should just suppose. Uh, so we read a lot about interconnection queues at the transmission level. Um, so to connect re renewables and green the grid, those queues have to be managed. Those queues exist at the distribution level as well. Can you talk a little bit about the role of those queues in delaying greening the grid and what you know, Con Ed and other utilities are doing about them? Yeah. So. What Rebecca kind of talks about is how do we think about plugging new resources in? This is the you know the concept of we're changing we're changing the engines in the plane, we're in flight, we're remaking how the energy system functions. Increasingly, the energy system, as you have more and more what are called distributed grid edge resources, or places where we're going to make power at or store power at the grid edge and re-inject it and essentially share the resource. Those interconnections are coming at the grid edge, and there are more and more resources coming on. So how we effectively manage the interconnection of those grid edge resources and make sure that we get them in as quickly as possible, but also as safely as possible, um, is a key element. It's an area that utilities have been, been struggling. The reality is we have always struggled a little bit with getting new service established to buildings. Typically a building, New York City building will go up, it may be a couple year development cycle, and it's often the last step is making that point of interconnection for service. And now in many cases, that's a bi-directional interconnection. Um, there are some solutions that we've been working on to try to kind of lower the friction in that. For small resources, we try to make it essentially, you know, check the box and you're done. If you're not going to export a lot of electricity from the grid, then you know you don't really need to talk to us that much and we can do that as quickly as possible. For resources that are going to export to the grid and make the grid flow bi-directionally, we want to make sure that we both have safety and reliability. So sometimes we have to study that. Increasing how we do those studies and try and do them faster with technology is kind of a key element to that. But it's one of the challenges that we're going to have as we go through this process is making sure that we can get everybody plugged into the grid in a way that works. Like electricity is a funny commodity. You have to you have to instantaneously match supply and demand. And unlike a lot of other commodities, like if you sell out of Coke at the local bodega, you're out. You can't take more. Electricity is a funny thing. If you everybody who wants it has the ability to take it no matter how much supply is available, even if it overloads things. It's kind of like saying on Thanksgiving, the the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, if you went to LaGuardia Airport, Everybody who wanted to get out of plane could just pile on, even if there's not enough seats in the plane. So the planning for that to make sure that we can match the capacity to the demand essentially falls in the grid planners because in the absence of that, the lights go out of the plane crash because you put 200 people on a 100 seat plane. 
Yep. Thank you so much for this really informative presentation this morning. Um, I haven't heard enough about conservation. Mm -hmm. How do we reduce the demand, right? Because nothing irks me more than walking on the sidewalk in the middle of the heat wave to see retailers with open doors and cold air blasting onto the sidewalk. So if you can just tell us a little bit about what Con Ed is doing in terms of reducing the demand, that would yeah. be great. Thanks. So uh, there's a saying, it's funny, uh, the prior question came from a person who now works for a different company, Rebecca, who used to do this for a living and focus on this exact issue. Um, Con Ed has a pretty long history in energy efficiency. We actually have what was pretty much the first conservation program in the United States. It went in the 1970s. So I can remember that, but a lot of people, I mean, pre it's an awful lot of people. It was the Con Ed Save a program. Over the last 15 years, Con Ed's programs have touched 2.5 million of our customers with ways to save and conserve energy. Because a kilowatt hour of energy that's avoided is never produced. It's in a lot of ways, it's the cheapest source of energy is to essentially have efficiency. And in many cases, it's absolutely the most environmentally friendly because you, you don't have to use any fossil fuel or resources for an efficient use of energy. So we have significant energy efficiency programs. Over the next couple of years, we're going to invest over a billion dollars in energy efficiency to encourage our customers to use energy more efficiently. And then there's how do we shift demand? How do we get customers to have the right incentives to say, hey, you know, the wind is blowing in a world with more renewable energy. The sun is shining. There's an abundance of energy. So let me use it now and let me shift my usage to when energy is available or cheaper and shift away from those times when it's more expensive or higher emitting. So the combination of energy efficiency efforts are kind of key to the things that we think about. And then demand flexibility, moving people's energy demand from different times, particularly as we get more and more intermittent renewables as part of the supply mix. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Strasser with Metro Express Services. We actually do traffic control for your, for your workers who, are, who need protection as, as they go into manholes, et cetera. Yep. Uh, can you talk about electric vehicle charging? You mentioned that you're uh, doing some new substations in Queens for heavy vehicles, for the transit authority, in the airports. But what about uh, neighborhood EV charging and uh, the accessibility for you know, someone in Brooklyn or Queens or the Bronx to be able to park their car and uh, charge it, say, overnight or just for hours. Yeah. So one of the big challenges in getting people to adopt electric vehicles has been what is the availability of charging infrastructure? It's kind of this range anxiety or chicken egg problem. Will I buy a new electric vehicle if I can't charge it? It's a little bit more challenging for New York City because so many people in New York don't necessarily have uh, private garages or driveways and park on the street. Um, so Con Ed actually has what is the largest electric vehicle charging program in the United States. Um, we are actually not going to be the owners of the charge head. So you won't necessarily pull up to a Con Ed branded charge facility and charge, but we're working with third party charge developers. So this is folks like Tesla, EVGo, um, who have and own charging infrastructure, and we're helping them get those facilities built across New York City. Um, some of the most highest utilization charge facilities for these developers happen to actually be in New York City right now. So this is something that we continue to work on and we'll continue to invest in as we work with private developers to essentially build those charging infrastructure stations across New York City. Thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. My name is Leila Logiziko. I'm the president of the City Club. And, you know, I would like to uh, get a better sense of the policy work that Con Ed is doing. Specifically, can you speak a little bit about the, the policy implications that you are pushing on um, if, if, um, efficiency of, uh, of buildings. You know, the, the, the building stock in New York City is actually fairly ineffective in terms of energy compared to others uh, in the world, in Europe or Asia. And then the other question is, you know, how do you work with uh, policy planners? Uh, the city is embarking on tremendous growth. Um, how, how does Con Ed, uh, you know, assist uh, policymakers, policy planners, and how do you think about these issues? Okay. So maybe on the first question, the relative efficiency of New York City building stock. I, I mentioned New York City buildings or how we heat, cool, 
provide hot water in our buildings is actually one of the largest sources of CO2 emissions in kind of the New York City metropolitan area. Part of that is our building stock here happens to be a little bit older than some of the place you reference. A lot of Europe kind of post-World War II was, was rebuilt in some of the urban areas. Um, a lot of Asia has newer building stock. So the New York City building stock on average is a little bit older. The newer building stock is on average very efficient. Um, but one of the challenges is going to be looking at some of those places like pre-war co-ops, um, buildings, and how do we modify the energy systems and insulation of those systems to essentially improve them over time. Um, that's a big piece of what our energy efficiency programs work with. A second piece of that is really driven by building code and standards. So we work closely with both state and local officials on what are the building codes and standards and requirements that are built in over time and how do we implement those. So I, I think a big piece of your question was, how does Con Ed engage both state and local authorities on policy? We meet with both regularly. There's a state energy efficiency team, both that works the state Department of Public Service and the New York State uh, the New York State Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA. Those are probably the two biggest state agencies that we meet with multiple times a week, typically at some working level on a number of these issues. And then New York City, we meet with a similar kind of cadence on what are some of the policy issues and then how do we tactically execute on what they're trying to get done um, at a working level. Hey. Can you comment on how Con Ed deals with new technologies like hydrogen? Assume that levelized cost uh, would be uh, market rate. Biden is, President Biden is putting in hydrogen hubs. Mm -hmm. You deal with infrastructure issues right now in your planning. You can't really make a great case for a while. So how does that fit into your planning and, and strategy? Yeah, so we kind of go through almost a continuous planning cycle. We refresh um, our kind of long range plan and kind of have a 10 and 20 year planning cycle in addition to like our annualized execution plans that happen basically in a two year cadence that we refresh them. Uh, so we are continuously planning, revising the plans, looking at what's happening in the city, what's economic growth in the city, what are changes in public policy that impact us um, and how do those things happen? Part of your question was around kind of technology. I think hydrogen, you specifically said. Um, so we were a participant in the solicitation for hydrogen hub for New York State. New York did not was not awarded one of the hydrogen hubs. Um, we do plan for kind of what are several different technology versions of clean energy. Hydrogen is one of those potentially clean fuels that you could you could potentially use and flow through your energy delivery systems. As an engineer, I have a lot of concerns about straight hydrogen flowing into buildings or flowing through the streets in New York City. Um, one, you can't have hydrogen be a one-for-one -one direct replacement for natural gas. Um, hydrogen is very, very volatile. Um, it burns from like five to 95 concentration in air. It's odorless. It's a much smaller molecule than methane. It would sneak out of pipe. So there's a lot of safety concerns that I would have around putting hydrogen into a building like this or into my grandmother's apartment. So there's a lot of safety concerns. Hydrogen is potentially a really good fuel to use in the industrial environment, places like power plants, where it's easier to control and make sure you have those safety protocols in place. Hydrogen potentially is a precursor to make synthetic methane. So if you could have green hydrogen, you can make synthetic methane that has a zero CO2 emission category to it. And then that's essentially a drop in fuel, a one for one replacement for natural gas that you could utilize the natural gas system in that hybrid scenario is talking about. The benefit of that is that people don't need to change their appliances. If you started flowing hydrogen into buildings, you would need to change the appliances people use because the energy characteristics of the two fuels are different. Um, I think the hybrid scenario with synthetic methane made from clean hydrogen is potentially a viable solution and maybe better for customers. As a utility, we probably don't really care in the sense that we serve customers with either commodity and we could make it work either way. But renewable gas through hydrogen potentially is a good solution for customers. And our natural gas system today actually didn't start as a natural gas system. It all called a natural gas system. It was a manufactured gas system. We've already changed the fuel that we flow once. I think we can change it again to a renewable synthetic natural gas. Well, thank you so much. This has been a really... A, a wonderfully stimulating morning and a, a very serious subject presented in a way that uh, all of us could understand. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us and join us. 
I also want to thank the questioners. Uh, I thought they were good questions, and I know there are more. Some of the students here, I hope you'll stay it later afterwards. And I will see how we recognize Tom Wright in the back from RPA. Um, glad that you are here. Um, another planning entity, very important in New York City. Ah, I had to bend down. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't disappear. Um, uh, but I, So uh, one of the things we like to do is present to... Um, the speakers at our breakfast, a uh, product of the scholarship of this law school, and so I'd like to present a thanks, a book by my colleague Molly Guptill Manning on the War of Words. It's about how um, how the press handled uh, issues during World War II, and I think you'll enjoy it very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it on this rainy day. Thank you all.